students, leadership, faculty, and administration. Athens community leadership and members, dear audience, I'm Hayasa Tamazian, International Student Union President. It's my pleasure to open the International Student Union's TED Talk and invite you all to enjoy the soul enriching talks of our speakers. This year, ISU has chosen a global community beyond diversity and toward unification theme for iWeek 2021. We aim to highlight the unity of the global community, which has not wavered under the circumstances caused by COVID-19. Moreover, the challenges brought us together and a unique bridge has been formed between the Ohio University international community and the local Athens community. Though the lockdown caused socioeconomic hardships for international students, the Ohio University community, including students, leadership, faculty, administration, and Athens community found a strong bond to come together and reaffirm their commitment toward unification beyond diversity. International students kept up with initiatives to stand with the community. An international student, Dennis Muth, initiated fundraising efforts to assist students in need. International Student Task Force, established by five international students and local students, advocated for financial assistance and food aid for hundreds of students. Ohio University created the International Students Emergency Fund, which provided financial assistance to international students. ISFS continuously kept the fundraising efforts on its operational framework and served as a platform for sharing sportive resources. The Office of Global Affairs at Ohio University established a fundraising campaign. Athens community stood with the students and provided food donations to Cat's Cupboard and financial donations to the International Student Emergency Fund. All these efforts not only shaped the presence of international students and opened a new humanitarian page at Ohio University, but it also taught us that the firm board of unification between the Athens community and international students is also our future. 
There is so much to learn from each other, and there is so much to share. Today, I'm standing in front of you as a proof that challenges have also not wavered. The commitment of the International Students Team of 2021. Working hand in hand with diverse communities at the Athens community, the International Students Union's team put together numerous educational, cultural, and motivational events hosted by students, faculty members, and Athens community members during the I Week. All these events would have been left on the paper if there has not been hard work and the commitment of the International Students Union's Vice President, Temi Olobakinde, Secretary, Amabat Emma Apiakubi, PR Director, Mary Magdalena Nagum Chumbo, ICU Advisor, Diane Cahill, Programming Director, Priscilla Serva Marfo, and Programming Team Members, Jenna Himan and Kurumi Yamada. By celebrating the cultural diversity of Ohio University and the joint efforts of the International Students Team and partners, now we launch the TED Talk event to tell you unheard stories about international student experiences, their contributions, and the unique bridge bringing together international students and the Athens community. Our speakers have diverse backgrounds. They are students and members of Ohio University Administration and Athens community. Please have a comfortable seat and enjoy our program. Our event is already in full swing. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. My name is Medrin Hilda Nyambura. I am a second year MFA student with the Scripps College, currently pursuing a degree in documentary filmmaking and new media storytelling. So before we proceed, I would like to wish all the March babies a very happy belated birthday, okay? And no matter what happens, you will always be a year younger. 2020 to 2021 does not count. And to all the students who graduated in a pandemic, be sure to add survived a pandemic in your life skills. Even better, add survived a pandemic in a foreign country. Top that. We joke, but I do not make light of the past year. It was March 12, 2020, when we got an email from the school that spring break had been extended. For any other year, this would be good news, but we all know that 2020 is the middle child of this century. At the time I was in Denver, Colorado, my friend and I had gone to visit her father. I was shooting a documentary to honor my friend's mom, who had passed away a couple of months before that. We got the news while at the Grand Canyon, one of the seven wonders of the world. That picture of me is a very nervous look because I didn't know what was coming, but the uncertainty could be felt. I have a very complicated relationship with snow because I grew up in a tropical country, so that explains um, the nervous smile. That's me trying to play it cool. And that's an image of me trying to pull a Kate Winslet, but that's the single edition. No Titanic, no Jack, no water, just me in the Grand Canyon. Besides the snow, was the uncertainty of the pandemic and what that meant to us as international students. Though, so there we were, an international student from Kenya and a Colorado native planning our next course of action in case this was the end. By some miracle, we made it back to Ohio after utter chaos at the airport and a very tense flight because of all the paranoia and helplessness that came with the mixed messaging that was happening. By the time we got to Athens, all the stores were closed. I did not have food in the fridge, and so we tried again the next day. We find a couple of items the next day, but there was no toilet paper, no napkins, no paper towels, nothing. You know, when they write the story of 2020, 
there will be a footnote about the scramble of toilet paper. There was the initial feeling that this would last a couple of months and then would go back to normal, but we all know what happened. The first few weeks were manageable. Pajamas, Netflix, and my favorite, stress baking, because the world was literally falling apart. So currently, there are 232 million banana bread recipes. 232 million to make it. If someone ever tells you that your job market is flooded, I want you to have the audacity of a banana bread, okay? There are many bad times where we lost our loved ones, including some of us in the room and those who are watching. We also lost some of the icons who served this world. To all the families, please receive my condolences. One that hit closer home is the feeling of helplessness, being away from our loved ones and depending on the news for updates and dealing with the anxiety that comes with all of that. But hey, we made it. And then there are important times that we didn't know were coming but needed them. The social justice movement of 2020 in the US and the rest of the world was an amplification of marginalized voices in the world who have been calling attention to all injustices that have long existed before you and I were here. As we speak, the legal process in the case of George Floyd is underway and we continue to hold up the family in strength as we relieve the trauma of May 25th, 2020. And just to be clear, this is a case against Derek Chauvin. You see, as human beings, we innately fear what we do not know. Knowing would require that we actually take action. And action can be positive, like the world rallying behind the people of color in this country, because we all know how it feels to be discriminated because of the color of your skin. Action can also be negative where you disgrace the symbol of democracy because social justice is so unfathomable to you, you would prefer that things stay as they were. For the record, that train has left the station. I know we want things to go back to normal, but there is no normal to go back to. The new normal is here. It's this, you watching these on YouTube, as opposed to actually being here at the Baker Center. In the new normal, there is no room for apathy but rather endless opportunities for participation. You must stand for something that is bigger than you. We cannot pledge ignorance anymore. It's very easy to feel helpless because everything feels so big and ambiguous. Sometimes it's the doubt of whether there's a role for you to make a change in a foreign land. While our perspective of the world is usually segmented, so we move from national and continental and global, humanity is universal. How we came together in 2020 is proof of that. Serve where you are, because in the new normal, physical barriers are blurred by similar experiences in different locations. Fear feels the same way everywhere. Loneliness feels the same in Armenia as it does in Malawi. Joy is felt the same way by everyone, whether you're in the room or you're watching this. So give yourself permission to show up where you are so that together we bring a unified approach to issues that continue to affect our community as international students, our immediate community, Athens, Ohio, and our world. When you're tempted to think that your effort does not count, I want you to remember the voters of Atlanta, Georgia. I also want you to remember the protesters who flooded the streets globally in Hong Kong, Sudan, Lebanon, Belarus, just to name a few countries. When you think your efforts will not matter, look at Allah Salah, the face of political revolution in Sudan. Or Greta Thunberg, one of the many voices championing climate change policy. Or Tarana, Tarana Bak of the hashtag MeToo movement and the many people whose work is felt but we may never know their names. 2020's social justice movement stood on the ears of work by those who came before us and may not have lived to see the fruits of their work. Even with decades to push for better, it still feels like we're at the starting point because this work is hard. In most cases, it may not even be rewarded in our lifetime, but that does not make it any less valuable. The new normal asks of us to be comfortable in 
difficult conversations. When it's easier to throw your hands in exasperation and give up, keep going. Recently, I met a family who have never engaged with a person of color because of where they live. It was a safe social space that allowed us to be comfortable. And after we shared some food, because you cannot do this on an empty stomach, we had excruciatingly difficult conversations on why we choose to treat people differently, because to us, they are the others. You and I may be considered the others because of where we were born, and the pandemic exacerbated that feeling. At the end of the day, we are our greatest assets. When things got hard, we had trivia night, we shared our fears, we shared socially distant meals, and held each other up through an extremely hard year. Ohio University did a great job to make sure that we did not feel sidelined, even as news media reported stories of international students all over the country who are stranded on their next course of action. Our professors who continue to support us, empathize, constantly checking in, even though we're in the same crisis, thank you. The pandemic brought us all together, but at the same time exposed the inequities that continue to exist. We saw each other naked, sometimes unintentionally, because the Zoom horrors of 2020 need to be a movie. We saw each other when we were most vulnerable. So the next time someone is attacked on the street because of their ethnicity and what they look like, say something. There are 116 countries represented at Ohio University. An attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. We know the devastation of wanting to protect our children because we do not fully understand what the danger is. Now we can empathize with parents all over the world who daily have to make difficult choices for their children. Nobody wants to be in a bad situation, but then again, we do not often opt into such circumstances. We work through them, and that work is for all of us. So find your spot and begin the work. You and I are here because diversity exists. Do not explain or justify your presence. Even when we may look different, speak different, are born different, or feel different, we earn our spot. Your job is to exist and take up your role in this world. The next time you're in a class or a meeting, at a job or anywhere, show up with excellence. Don't get me wrong, it's okay to have differing opinions moral standing, faiths, political alignment, and beliefs. That's what makes our world as vibrant as we know it. But there needs to be common ground on human dignity. Because if there's one lesson we've learned from 2020, it's that we all know how it feels when the walls are caving in. That is how we get to intentional diversity and achieve unification. I am not blind to the fact that there are people who will go through this pandemic and still choose to not do better. But my focus is you, you and me, those of us who choose to show up because someone somewhere is depending on us to do something. The ripple effect of our work will be felt by the next generation. The work needed to make our community, our world a better place for everybody is no small feat. It is slow. It is painful, it can be thankless, but it's worth it. Thank you. Dear Mary and Dad, thank you very much for your talk. It was really very inspiring. Thank you. And it's very true that we grow through the new reality. Mm -hmm. We found ourselves and we made it. And now we are here sharing our stories with all the world, yes. especially Ohio University and Athens community. Mm -hmm. So coming up for the, our Q&A session, I would like to ask you, I have noticed that in your speech, the work, word mm -hmm. stands in a very unique way. And it seems that it highlights something more than just the word. Mm -hmm. Please, can you elaborate about it more? Um, OK, I feel like where we are at at the semester, <laughs> everyone understands work. Um, but in this context, it's 
I, I feel like as human beings, because of how our systems are structured, it's very hard to identify what it is you're supposed to do in this world. And some people are lucky to do that in the line of their work, right? So your job is what you feel and you are put on earth to do. And then some, some people are not lucky. They just have jobs that pay the bills and they always wonder, do I have meaning in this world? Is there something I can do? So the work for me is finding what resonates with you, finding what you feel you can make a change in. And this could be anything. In most cases, um, the way we've shown it in the media is politically or fame. That's not what I mean. I mean even in Athens, Ohio, as an international student, you've come here to earn your PhD or your master's. So give or take three to eight years, right? You can still find something to do here that resonates with who you are and the change you want to make. And when the time comes, you literally just transfer that back home. So for me, the work is a call to all of us to know that we are all brilliant, number one. What you want to do in your home country is gonna work. But it's okay to start here and start where you are. Because think about it. I'm a Kenyan, you're Armenian, right? If we have international students in our specific countries and they all do the work, then it means we are all doing exactly what we need to do and we have solutions as opposed to waiting to go back to your country. So that's my challenge to us and that's what I mean by work. Thank you very much. It's truly, that's the way that how we feel. And it's so admiring and it's so like inspiring that we as like international students, we see that opportunities at mm -hmm. Ohio University and the beauty is here that Ohio University provides that platform for us to grow for mm -hmm. leadership, for all the sectors of the of the life and find adapt this new reality. Exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's really nice having you. You too. And you could be president of your country as well, just saying. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. <laughs> Dear audience. As you see, we are growing more for the new reality and we are looking forward to have our second speaker. Please welcome him. Good evening and thank you for inviting us into your living rooms, ISU. Thank you for inviting me to, the, your, to be a part of your program tonight. I wanna to start out by saying we are a better university by having ISU here and having such a strong and vibrant international student community. Um, we're all better for it. And so I, th I thank you for, for putting on events like this. I think that it's great. Um, my name is Josh Grinke. I am um, the Associate Director of the Campus Involvement Center here. I have worked in student governments um, for almost two decades now, which makes me feel incredibly old. Um, for, in one form or another, starting out as a student government president, when I was an undergraduate and um, student representative on the board of trustees, which is kind of how I have found myself with a passion for student governance. And I am in the PhD program here at Ohio University where I've been researching a lot of student governance issues and student activism. And as we get started tonight, I hope that you're comfortable in your living rooms. And I'm gonna ask you to perhaps do something a little uncomfortable. And I'm sorry to get started that way, but if you will join me in reflecting back on when we first learned about COVID and when we first learned about our lockdown situation, our restrictions, and think about how you were impacted. Chances are high that you maybe learned some new sourdough recipes, maybe you were quarantined and haven't been able to see friends, family, perhaps you've lost a loved one, perhaps you've been sick. Um, what I'm saying is that COVID has been hard on all of us, not a single one of us have gotten out of this unscathed. But I want you to think about international students for a second and how they were impacted by COVID. They had all of those situations that we just talked about, but also on top of all of that, they're now perhaps stuck in, a, stuck in Athens, which they weren't planning to be here for the summer, unable to go back home, unable to see their families. They're now having to figure out how they're going to pay for living, living expenses they weren't planning on having, paying for uh, finding shelter, finding housing, all things they weren't planning to do, all while not being allowed to work in, the country, in, 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 in America because of their uh, status as international students. So as we're thinking back on that, that's the context for which I started thinking about um, what would happen if international students were intentionally and structurally mandated to be included in the student government structure at OU? Would they have had better access to advocacy and the structural advantages 
that are inherent and unique because of the relationships student governments have with administration? Would they have had to spend so much valuable time on an education campaign to student leaders and our administrators about how COVID was impacting their lives? These are barriers to overcome because their voice presently isn't at the governance, student governance table. And it is my goal to use the time that we have together to advance and advocate for the idea that international students need representation on our student senate that is intentional and constitutionally mandated. I will propose a solution to the lack of international representation that is rooted in student governance theory and can be achieved through classical organizational change theory. The first thing I want us to all do is collectively understand what the history of student governance is, and more specifically, student governance at OU. I myself, in an effort to better understand these concepts, interviewed the immediate past Student Senate President, Lydia Ramlow, and the founder and executive director of the American Student Government Association, W.H. Butch Oxidine. These interviews were um, critical and helped me understand current national trends in student governance, as well as how these trends uh, may be playing out here at OU, and I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank both of those individuals for being so generous with their time um, in speaking with me. Student government, student government in its current form is a fairly recent phenomenon and has been decades in the making. Students first organized as a means to have a voice in the collegiate experience, and it started out as literary societies. And as universities became larger, the models of self-governance changed and became more powerful. Today, using the student governance theory, we can say generally that the duties of representatives in student government include serving as the voice of the student body to the institution's administration, overseeing student fees, supervising student organizations, and running campus programming. These bodies also currently participate in decision-making processes in student affairs and academic and administrative affairs. The foundation of this theory is that students must be a part of their own governance. In student governance theory, there are also multiple viewpoints of how students are engaged in the governance of their campus in their institution, um, with relationships between students and administration being the deciding factor for the degree into which students play a role in decision making. And for the sake of time, I'm only going to focus on one viewpoint, and that is the stakeholder viewpoint. And that's how I'm going to frame our arguments today. Um, and that is because based on the resources that Ohio University has already dedicated to students, to students in it and shared governance, um, it's pretty obvious that they see um, students as genuine partners in, in governing of OU, and that based on this view and concept, students are more than just consumers of a product that the university is selling. Rather, they are deeply impacted by decisions made, and therefore should be and need to be included in the decision-making process. On to Ohio University, when we're looking at student governance here, Ohio University, the legislative body, is called the Student Senate, and it's made up of senators that represent their colleges, voted on by other students within their respective colleges. However, there are also a few at-large reps, and they are selected to represent specific populations such as Greek life and off-campus students. There's also judicial and executive branches. Today, we're only focusing on the legislative branch. It's important to know the job and the structure of student government, in fact, critical to understanding the proposal that I'm about to make, and that is, <clears throat> That is in an effort to create a more representative student senate. I argue that student senate should add a seat for international student representation, and that this seat would be held by a member of the international student community and voted on exclusively by other international students. As with any change that's being proposed, I think it's important that we also look at some of the barriers and how we as a community can overcome those. I think number one being there's a lack of interest in student government elections and student governments across the country. National turnout in student elections hovers at about 12%, and there are multiple open and uncontested seats in any given year on Student Senate, which does extend the argument, I would think, that there are already so many open seats on a consistent basis, could a current BC be reapportioned to the international student rep seat? But to me, the larger question, and one that is fundamental, is why aren't students participating in their student elections? Is it because they feel disconnected from their representatives? Do they feel like they're being represented? Research has shown that a major source of student legislator concern is that they don't know their constituency outside of their social circles. If students felt more represented, would they turn out and vote in higher numbers? Would international students be more likely to participate in voting if they were more directly represented? 
Another barrier that is highly noted in literature is how does the student body decide which populations receive constitutionally mandated apportionment on Senate? I think that's a great question and a really fair question and a real concern and one that I honestly don't have a definitive answer for. But what I do know is that here on our campus at Ohio University, Student Senate, student senate already does this. They already have apportions, they already apportion representatives to specific student populations via at-large representatives like I was talking earlier for Greek life and off-campus students. And I think that these are really valuable voices and I think that it, it's great to have them on our body. I, I also think that any process that guarantees representation of constituencies is a step in the right direction. I would also argue that because this practice is already happening within our own structure, it's a void question for us here because that slippery, slippery slope has already started. I would also point out, and bear with me because it does get a little dense here in process-oriented things, but I would also point out that international students are already are disenfranchised from the commission structure that Senate uses to advance legislation to the full Senate. There are many commissions that are based on identity, including an International Affairs Commission. However, unlike the other commissions that are identity-based, any senator can be the chair of International Student Affairs Commission. Whereas, for example, on the Black, Affairs Commission, Black Student Affairs Commission, it, that, that commission must be represented by a black student. And any other of the identity-based groups have to be chaired by someone that shares that identity. The International Affairs Commission is the only exception to this rule in all of Senate, and I could find no reason for this exception. But I do think it furthers the argument that international students are currently disenfranchised from all forms of student representation at the student senate level. I make the argument that the tenet of student, the fundamental tenet of the student government, governance theory is that for students to be a part of their own government, that students must be a part of their own governance. International students are students here and must be represented and because international students are not only excluded from meaningful representation on the student body itself, they are also the only exception to the rule of representative governance in the commission structure that hypothetically allows for international students to be heard. It becomes even more critical to me that international students be given this seat on Senate and for that seat to be occupied by an international student because it is impossible for domestic students to represent international students. And currently they dominate the structure. This is a problem before COVID. Outside of COVID, international students experience Ohio University in a way not aligned with their domestic peers. While all students are adjusting to a new environment in college, international students have to also navigate a cross-cultural adjustment that forces them to acclimate to college while also navigating language barriers, new academic systems, cultural differences, and often racial discrimination. The lived experience of international students produces acculturation stress as they deal with compounding stressors and it is only through participatory representation and governance can international students advocate for measures that have shown to be effective in relieving those stresses that they experience during their transition, such as peer mentoring and focused outreach on behalf of the university to the international population. Before I shift to the implementation of my, of my proposal, we should first address that student missions to universities have shifted dramatically. Therefore, the needs of representation have also changed to better accommodate a more diverse population. In, the, in their inception, universities were the domain of basically only white men and basically to be um, trained as religious leaders. Since World, War, there's always, since World War II, that demographic has changed quite a bit to include the admittance of women and other minorities. The inclusion of international students is a natural progression of the ever-changing body that is represented in student governance. However, I do, um, I know that it can be difficult to implement any changes, and so I do have a framework that would help um, our community move this proposal forward, and that is um, the classical organizational change theory. In making the proposal to change the structure for the seat on students and it to be exclusively represented by the population, I did use this, um, this theory to, to frame the argument. There are five prongs of, of the theory which argue that change is inevitable in an organization and the changes must meet this criteria. It must be planned, organization-wide, managed from the top, increases effectiveness of the organization and happens through planned interventions. First, is this change planned? 
A change of structure to the Senate body and voting allocations would require a constitutional amendment. Therefore, the change would be planned and proposed by the executive committee, which also meets the criteria of change being initiated from the top, as well as being a planned intervention. The other prongs are easily met when considering that the effectiveness of an organization would increase as it would be better able to represent the views and needs of marginalized population, populations that have no other means of representation within the current framework. The inclusion of a dedicated seat for international students would impact more than just student senate itself. It would also allow for the reversal of the exemption of the International Affairs Commission from having an international student be the chair, thus expanding the change to be an organization-wide implementation. In conclusion, it must be said, this is not an attack on Ohio student senate. I think they do a great job, especially in the area of student advocacy, and deserve applause for the work that they have done. And that this is not something, international student representation, the lack thereof, is not something that is regulated to only OU. It's a national problem. And I, and I think that COVID has given us the opportunity to reevaluate which systems were working for us and which were hindering us before, and that we are now uniquely situated to make some drastic changes to make some of our systems more inclusive and ultimately stronger. It would be a wasted opportunity not to address this critical lack of representation in our current national climate. Further, I wanna make clear that I am not arguing that it is the job of international students to educate us, the domestic members of the OU community, about their lived experience. Rather, it is the job of students, faculty, staff, and administration that own some privileged identities to correct a system that does not allow for meaningful representation of our international peers. And it's our responsibility to invite our international students to the table, to hear their concerns, and it is our duty to do the work to make OU and Student Senate a more inclusive place. With that, thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Dear Josh, thank you very much thank you. for your talk. And it's so admiring and it's so encouraging to see that you are highlighting not only the role of the international students in the shared governance, but also you are teaching us and you are educating us about the growth areas. So to think that you dedicated your time to explore the growth areas in Ohio University, I'm interested in have you also grabbed how the cause is grabbed by the other universities. Sure, like I said, like I said earlier, this is not um, a problem that is specific to OU, and I think that OU is, is using mechanisms um, to, to overcome. I think that there's definitely some collaboration and work between Student Senate and international students. I think that's great. I just want to see it formalized. I think that, I think that um, nobody should have to ask to be at the table. They should be invited, um, and so, I did look at some other schools um, to kind of see what they're doing about the situation, and a lot of them have um, done kind of what I've proposed, and that's set a seat aside for international students. The, um, some universities have that be elected by international students. Some have that uh, position appointed um, by, usually the appointment comes with like the president of the ISU would be that position, and some bodies have it as a voting member and some not a voting member. Um, but all of them, I think that this is something that is, seeping into the, the consciousness of, of students now, and they want to make sure that we are being as inclusive as possible. And I have to be honest with you, it's not something that I had spent a whole lot of time thinking about until I really was thinking about how COVID had impacted me, my community, people that I know, people that I love. And then I got a couple calls this summer um, from, from you all, from, from ISU, asking me about different things, um, avenues that were available to start raising money. And, and it, I was on vacation at the time and it really made me stop and think about like that experience and how terrible COVID was for me as a fairly like comfortable person. And what would happen if I all of a sudden couldn't get home or I couldn't um, provide for myself in the way in which I thought that I would be. I mean, I had to find roof and food. like. Those stressors are, are, are heavy and a lot. And so that's kind of what made me start wanting to investigate like what role international students are playing here in, in the governance. And I do, ISU does have a role in that. I think it's really important that ISU is doing that. But I think that ISU also has um, an important role in, in programming and um, 
welcoming international students, giving them a home and giving them, you know, community. I don't want ISU to feel like their only job is policy driven and things like that. I think there's, there's a, it's too much, it's too much. And so I think it's just really important to kind of look, look at that holistically. Thank you very much. Like, you know, Josh, having this scholarly based, analyzed feedbacks is always like uh, encouraging and always welcome for us international students sharing, like uh, taking roles in the decision makings in the student lives. In the so the thing that uh, I wanted to also like thank you, acknowledge your efforts and say like, it's not only about like being a transactional uh, like a transnational, transactional leader, but it's also so important to be like a transactional professor, administrator, faculty member at Ohio University. And like, I truly enjoy it. I'm here two years, in two years, and I always enjoy it, being and seeing your work in the lives of the international students and also all students at Ohio University. Uh, Thank we you appreciate that the CIC is, is, we stand ready to help um, all students and we're glad that we can, that we've had an impact, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. And now we are joining and now we are mo moving forward and we are going to welcome our last and the third speaker. He's going to teach us and he's going to share with us the amazing and like uh, the tremendous experience that Athens community brought in the lives of international students. Please welcome him. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Jerry Kurzik and I direct the Ohio Program of Intensive English at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. My work here brings me into contact with students and professionals from all over the world. And prior to assuming my position at Ohio, I was a student teacher in Brazil. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Korea. I was a faculty member at Chuba University in Japan and a Fulbrighter in Yugoslavia. And throughout these travels, there are two things that I've learned. The first thing is people will help you in time of need, no matter where you are. And the second thing is, if you offer some service or some act of kindness in the future, you'll likely be repaid. And today I would like to describe the experiences and what I've witnessed over these past 12 months that just affirm these beliefs. Really what goes around comes around. So let me begin by talking about what happened in spring of 2020, a time that we all remember. One day I was working at home, like all of us, because of COVID, and I received an invitation via Zoom for something called the ISTF. Now I had no idea what it was and so, so usually when I deal with ambiguity, I will try to check out the situation. So I accepted the invitation. And when I accepted it and went to the Zoom meeting, I found a group of international students from Ohio University leading the meeting. And they were joined by other members across campus. There were some people representing local organizations. And there were also just some individuals from the community. I learned uh, at that time that the goal of the group was to advocate for the international students who are experiencing great hardships during COVID here, particularly economics, economically and also with food insecurity. They were unable to pay rent bills, other bills they had, and meals were a big issue. So the uh, initial meeting uh, led to a series of bi-weekly Friday meetings with other members joining as we went along. And our mission evolved the more we uh, learned about the issues the students were facing. We focused primarily on uh, contributing food to the cat's cupboard, fundraising because of the economic need, and just advertising our efforts into the community so we can engage other members. Uh, fortunately, an International Student Emergency Relief Fund was begun through a generous donation by the local county foundation. And to give you a flavor of what was happening at these virtual meetings, here are some email exchanges uh, that we had. Um, 
please talk to this person. They know this. Please talk to him. He knows these other people. Here are some mediation talking points for negotiating your rent payments. This organization is going to make a donation. I haven't heard back from the others. On and on, we would be engaged in these kind of conversations. A big part of it, too, was getting the weekly food list from the cat's cupboard. They would give us the items of priority that were needed. And uh, they would give us comments about the state of their shelves. And so here are some pictures of some of the donations that were happening at that time. Again, we would receive these emails from them. They would say, tell us there's an ongoing need for evaporated milk. The nuts have been a big hit that you're providing. Could you resupply? Can you get some black eyed peas for us? On and on, there were these comments. And then soon, just the thanks started rolling in uh, from different students. Uh, people, students were commenting, you saved my life this year, thank you. Heartfelt thanks for the emergency relief front from students from Kenya, from Laos, from Sudan. Uh, and soon, you know, the efforts grew. Over 15 local organizations got involved, ranging from church groups, nonprofits, local service groups, the government of the city of Athens, and individual citizens too. And if you'd like to know more about this, check out the September 9th edition of the Athens News. Now, one thing that was a byproduct of our meetings, after we got done with the, the task at hand, we would sometimes ask, how is everybody feeling? And students told us of their difficulties adjusting to life in Athens, how they were missing their families back home. They were missing family events, such as birthdays. They wanted to go back home. They were unable to go back home. And it was a time for us to learn more about them. And we shared our experiences too. And in essence, it became an emotional support network and it was good for all of us. And one of the student leaders summed it up by saying this quote, just being listened to alone makes a difference. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to meet the wonderful people on our advisory committee. And, it, and that has been the biggest impact my engagement here has taught me, giving back because I have received so much. Like that student, I experienced an unexpected moment of giving back courtesy of the Korean government during November when a parcel appeared at my doorstep marked KF COVID-19 survival box. Inside the box were face masks, masks, gloves, uh, cultural items, skincare products, all kinds of health items, and a letter from the Korean government saying that this was a token of their appreciation for my work as a Peace Corps volunteer many years ago in Korea. The Korean government sent over 500 of these boxes to former Peace Corps volunteers who had served in Korea, saying that, again that this was a token of their appreciation. So in essence, Korea was reaching out to us as we had reached out to them many years ago. And what goes around comes around. And you can find more of this in the December 4th Athens Messenger and the November 20th New York Times. But now back to our group. We still meet every other Friday, but now the main agenda is how to continue this momentum and how to get our international students engaged in our local community. And I think the student engagement in community is best exemplified in my next story. I really learned all the details this past March. It's called Pat and Judy and features the Benya family from Ghana and the McGinn family from Athens, Ohio. The story begins actually in 2004, September, when Edward Benya arrived from Ghana to study for a degree in African studies. Like most students coming from abroad, Edward had a difficult time adjusting. In the classroom, American students would shout out answers to the professor instead of like Ghana, where students politely raise their hand and patiently wait to answer their questions. Edward was frustrated. He could never answer or ask a question in class because all the students were asking all the, all the questions. In addition, there was, his family was not here. He had to undergo some minor surgery. There was nobody to ask for assistance. His roommate wasn't around. But then in early March, his wife, Pat, also came to be with him. Now, this was 
a joyful reunion for the family, but it also created more anxiety. Edward now uh, worried about his wife, Pat. She was stuck in the apartment. She couldn't drive. She had the baby, Edward Jr. If he was sick, who should, could, could she go for, to for support? And Edward was uh, working at the uh, Ohio University garage, washing cars, driving the cat shuttle, going to class, trying to do his homework and taking care of his family. At times he felt like going back home. But suddenly one day after Pat's arrival to Athens, Pat and Edward experienced what they call an angelic intervention and an angel in the form of Athens resident, Judy McGinn appeared. Judy was a former Peace Corps volunteer that served in the Philippines. She worked as a librarian at the Athens County Library and she was married to Dick McGinn, who was a professor at OU. Judy knew what it was like to live in another country. The challenges of cultural adjustment, not being without your support family and the loneliness that can happen. And then, so one day she went to the ISFS office on campus and asked to uh, be matched with a student from Ghana. Fortunately for Edward, he had a friend from Zambia who was working in the office and he told Judy about Pat. That same day, Judy called Pat and invited her to go shopping. And after shopping, they went to Judy's house for scones and coffee. And Pat can still, still tell you the taste of those scones. The relationship had begun. And over time, Judy and Pat became best friends. Wherever Judy went, Pat went. The farmer's market, shopping, the Columbus Zoo, the movies, Edward Jr. was with them. They talked every other day on the phone. Judy became Pat's cultural advisor, helping her with language and culture. In fact, one day in late March, Pat was sitting home alone in her apartment and with Edward Jr. and she noticed something coming from the sky. What's going on, she thought, is this the end of the world? Pat immediately phoned Judy, Judy, what is this? Judy told her, Pat, it's just a late spring snow, don't worry. And Pat also became Judy's cultural advisor. She taught Judy how to cook food from Ghana, rice and red beans. She also taught Judy how to braid hair because Judy was very interested in learning about braiding hair. Now, Pat told her it was probably gonna hurt, but Judy persisted. And so Pat braided her hair. And after she was done, Judy joked that she couldn't turn her neck. Still, she kept the braids for almost a week. Their friendship deepened even more. When Pat and Edward's second child was born in Athens, they asked Edward Jr., who was three and a half at the time, what he thinks would be a good name for his sibling. Edward Jr. answered, Judy. There was one problem. It was a boy. So they decided on the name Jude in honor of Judy. A third child came later, Angelina, and both Dick and Judy attended her baptism. In 2007, Edward and Pat moved to Morgantown, West Virginia, where Edward is going to pursue a PhD degree. To Pat, it was the saddest time of her life. She didn't want to leave Athens because of Judy. In fact, Judy and Pat would drive back and forth between Athens and Morgantown to see each other because that was the only way that Pat said she would move to Morgantown. Well, in 2018, Edward returned to Ghana. He accepted a position as a professor there, but Pat stayed behind to complete a bachelor's degree at West Virginia University. Judy always encouraged her to continue her education. And during COVID, they kept in contact via phone, via online, virtually. And then in December, 2020, Pat had to return home to Ghana because her degree was finished. She was sad to leave Judy. But sadly, Judy passed away from COVID in March of 2021. It was really at this time that I learned all the details of Judy and Pat's story at a moving celebration we had for Judy that was online. And Edward and Pat participated even though it was 3 a.m. in the morning in Ghana. The entire Benya family will never forget the McGinn family in Athens. 
and all the result of Judy reaching out on a cold day in March, 2005. For me, the stories that I've told you, the ISTF task force, the COVID survival box, Judy and Pat, just shows the results that people can achieve when they come together to help each other. A diverse group of individuals are able to unify in a common effort. I know there are many other people that are serving and helping each other right now in Athens. I wish we could recognize them all today. Time does not allow it. Today was just three stories. Our challenge going forward will be able to continue this momentum to help our students feel supported and connected with our community. If we can achieve this, the benefits to OU and the Athens community will multiply. After all, what goes around comes around. Thank you very much for listening. Today, we collected kindness in Athens, captured the inspiring and enriching experiences of the group in this new reality, highlighted the importance of counting the voice for shared governance, and archived all this for this event. The talks educate and remind us the life of a human being that is all about us, rather than I. It teaches that we truly need to open to giving and receiving unconditionally as it makes the right meaningful and beautiful that we call life. As we are moving to close the event, I would like to take this moment and express deep gratitude to the speakers, Medrina Hilda Niambura, Josh Gringi, and Dr. Gerard Kurzik. I would also like to thank you to the Ohio University Event Services, especially Amber Luke and Joy Gilkim for their valuable contribution to the event's implementation. The beauty of this world is in it diversity. Today, for our TED Talk, celebrated the, we celebrated the cultural diversity at Ohio University. Thank you for all of you to supporting us by joining our event. I will encourage everyone to check our social media accounts and join the Wing Clock celebration. iWeek is already in its full swing. Thank you very much.